Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Medicine Grand Rounds. Just for those of you that are using the um, CME credits, the credit code is posted on the board and on the first slide. Um, I'd like to go ahead and just get started. Um, you need the code? Okay. 36499. Okay. So uh, Dr. Molly Gologli is our featured speaker today for Grand Rounds. Dr. Gologli received a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Grinnell College in Iowa where she was not only admitted to the prestigious Honor Society of Phi Beta Kappa, but also awarded a Goldwater Scholarship. Later, she completed her medical degree and PhD in pharmacology in 2011 here at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. We were lucky enough to later have Dr. Gologli uh, as not only a medical resident in internal medicine, but also as a fellow in the Division of Hematology and Oncology, during which time she served as chief fellow graduating in 2017. In her role as a physician scientist, Dr. Gologli is currently working to build a comprehensive graft-versus-host disease clinic aimed at improving patient outcomes, appropriately referring patients to subspecialties, and enrolling patients in clinical trials. In her scholarly work, Dr. Gologli has been the lead author of multiple papers spanning a wide array of topics, including the role of glutaredoxins in the regulation of redox balance and apoptotic signaling, as well as the identification of safe and effective treatments for elderly patients with AML. She also serves as the local principal investigator for multiple sponsored clinical trials, including Gravitas 301, which is studying the use of combination therapy with, and I'm going to butcher this word, I'm sorry, itacitinib, okay, got it on the second try, and corticosteroids for the treatment of graft-versus-host disease, as well as the trial Modulate, which is studying the safety and efficacy of using alpha-1 antitrypsin for the prevention of graft-versus-host disease in patients receiving hematopoietic stem cell transplants. In addition to all of her other accomplishments, Dr. Gologli is a recipient of many awards, including the 2018 Paul Calabrese Career Development Award for Clinical Oncology. It is uh, my privilege now to introduce Dr. Molly Gologli, and her presentation on building a graft versus host disease program here at UH Seidman Cancer Center. All right. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for the introduction. I'm excited today to introduce you to the graft versus host disease program that we're building here at Seidman Cancer Center. First, I have no financial disclosures. Today, I hope to help you understand the mechanisms and clinical manifestations of graft-versus-host disease, identify new therapeutic strategies in GVHC treatment, and introduce Seidman Cancer Center's graft-versus-host disease clinic and our graft-versus-host disease trials within the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. We will do this by defining graft-versus-host disease and its clinical burden by reviewing the mechanisms of graft-versus-host disease pathogenesis, including new therapeutic targets, describe ongoing trials that are investigating the therapeutic potential of these new targets, introduce the graft-versus-host disease program at Simon Cancer Center, and finally, uh, introduce educational and academic opportunities for U.S. trainees. So graft-versus-host disease, or GVHD, is a complication of hematopoietic stem cell transplant, so let's start there. Hematopoietic stem cell transplant, which I will refer to as stem cell transplant for the remainder of the talk, is a potentially curative treatment for diseases of the hematopoietic system. This includes red blood cell diseases, such as sickle cell disease, white blood cell diseases, most of which are malignancies, bone marrow failure syndromes, and immune diseases including both immunodeficiencies and autoimmune disorders. Stem cell transplant may also be used to treat rare metabolic diseases, usually in pediatric populations. Stem cell transplant is performed in two major steps. The first step rids the body of the diseased hematopoietic tissue. This is achieved using chemotherapy with or without radiation, which is shown here on the right, and is referred to as the conditioning regimen. Conditioning uh, eradicates or minimizes malignancy it creates a physical space for engraftment, and it suppresses the recipient's immune system, thus preventing rejection. In the second step of stem cell transplant, there is infusion of hematopoietic stem cells into the recipient. 
donor stem cells may be derived from three potential sources. Shown first on the left, they can be purified from bone marrow, which is harvested from the donor in the OR under general anesthesia. Second, they may be purified from circulating blood, which is shown in the middle, using an apheresis machine. And this is done after a donor is treated with a mobilizing medication that releases bone marrow stem cells into the circulating blood. Finally, they may be purified from umbilical cord blood after the delivery of a baby. Now, I haven't seen a cord blood collection, but I'm pretty sure the baby is not the one doing it. Um, the bone marrow, apheresis stem cells, or cord blood cells undergo further processing and are then infused into the recipient through a central catheter. Unlike solid organ transplant, there is no actual surgery performed on the recipient of a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. There are two main types of stem cell transplant. In autologous transplant, the donor and the recipient are the same individual. Prior to conditioning, stem cells are collected through apheresis and then they are cryopreserved. The purpose of the stem cell infusion is to repopulate the marrow after ablative chemotherapy. In terms of treating the underlying disease, the chemotherapy is actually doing the work. The stem cells simply rescue the marrow from irreversible toxicity from chemotherapy. In allogeneic transplant, the donor and the recipient are two different individuals. This allows the stem cell graft to perform two functions. First, as an autotransplant, it repopulates a depleted marrow. But second, it helps eradicate residual disease. So how does it do that? Depending on how much you liked immunology, this will either be your favorite or least favorite part of the talk. <laughs> So remember that the body differentiates self and non-self through interactions at the immune synapse. The immune synapse consists of a T cell with a T cell receptor, shown here, and a somatic cell or an antigen presenting cell holding an antigenic peptide within an HLA molecule. T cells may be activated by recognition of either a non-self peptide in a self HLA, a non-self HLA, or both. In autologous transplant, shown here, a donor T cell interacts with a recipient cell and sees a self-peptide in a self-HLA molecule, and the result is tolerance. In allogeneic transplant, tolerance may not occur fully for reasons that will be shown in this slide. In this scenario, the orange individual donates cells to the blue recipient. The first picture is shown for reference, and it illustrates an autologous transplant for the orange patient. Orange donor T cells do not destroy the orange donated stem cells because they share self-peptides and are HLA identical. However, the blue recipient cells may exhibit non-self-peptides, shown in green, such as tumor antigens or protein fragments that differ between individuals due to genetic polymorphisms that are not routinely matched prior to transplant, and these are referred to as minor HLA mismatches. In addition, not all transplants are major, major HLA matched, so donor cells may recognize non-self HLA molecules, which are shown in red. Any of, um, oh, and finally, recipient cells um, may exhibit both non-self peptides and non-self HLA molecules. Any of these scenarios leads to T cell activation and recipient cell destruction. When recipient cells are residual cancer cells, this alloreactivity is referred to as the graft versus tumor effect. For those who prefer words to pictures, the alloreactivity in stem cell transplant leading to graft versus tumor effect may be based on the list that's shown, which is the expression of unique antigens by the recipient, which may be either related to cancer or an underlying genetic polymorphism, or they may be based on HLA mismatch. Several observations support the importance of graft versus tumor properties in the success of stem cell transplant. The curves shown on the right of the slide are taken from a study showing the rates of relapse among patients who underwent stem cell transplant for AML with either identical twin or HLA matched sibling donors. Identical twin donors share the same genetic polymorphisms and major and minor HLA antigens. In contrast, HLA matched non-twin siblings share only their major, major HLA molecules and may differ in minor HLAs and genetic polymorphisms. Recipients with less genetic similarity to their donors, which is the HLA identical siblings that were not twins, had a lower relapse rate, which supports a role for alloreactivity in the success of stem cell transplant. 
So you might be wondering why I spent all this time talking about alloreactivity and not graft-versus-host disease. And the reason is that if you understand alloreactivity, then you can understand GVHD. So it turns out that for the most part, graft-versus-host disease is an extension of the graft-versus-tumor phenomenon. In the case of graft-versus-tumor, T cells recognize cancer cells as non-self, obviously a cancer cell here, um, and target their destruction. But what if a T cell recognizes a non-malignant intestinal cell, liver cell, or skin cell as non-self? And that's what happens in GVHD. So how do donor cells turn against non-malignant recipient cells? It's generally thought to happen in three main steps. In the first step, which is shown at the top, the conditioning regimen causes damage to recipient tissues, especially the skin and the gut mucosa. That damage causes the relief the release of cytokines and damage associated molecular patterns, or DAMPs, which then activate uh, donor and recipient immune cells. In the second step, donor T cells interact directly with host antigen presenting cells, where alloreactivity then occurs based on what we discussed in prior slides, um, based on recognition of non-self peptides or HLA molecules. In the third step, cellular and molecular effectors of inflammation are activated and released triggering inflammation and tissue damage. Importantly, a T cell population called regulatory T cells, or Tregs, help mitigate the interactions in step two and are thought to play an important role in limiting the extent of GVHD. GVHD has two patterns of clinical manifestations, which are generally divided according to the time of onset, although there are exceptions. Acute GVHD, which usually occurs within the first 100 days of transplant, affects the skin, liver, and or GI tract. Skin rash is generally maculopapular and pruritic and is graded according to the percent of body surface area involved. Upper GI involvement causes anorexia or nausea, while lower GI involvement primarily causes watery diarrhea and is graded according to daily stool volume. The pictures to the right show the growth and histologic views of GI involvement in which inflammatory infiltrates efface the normal architecture of the GI mucosa. Liver involvement is characterized by elevated bilirubin. It's important to note that GVHD can be diagnosed definitively with tissue biopsy, but biopsies may be nonspecific and even too risky to perform depending on the clinical status of the patient. Often, GVHD ends up being a clinical diagnosis with a broad differential, including infectious and iatrogenic etiologies. Chronic GVHD can affect nearly every organ system, and it's primarily characterized by dryness and fibrosis. Skin findings are more diverse than in acute GVHD and may include sclerotic changes that cause a high bound appearance. Dryness of the eyes, mouth, and genitourinary tract are common sources of discomfort for patients. Limitations uh, to joint range of motion can compromise a patient's ability to exercise or perform activities of daily living. And GI involvement can interfere with adequate nutrition, and lung involvement can limit activity and predispose to infection. Shown here are some of the skin, mouth, and nail findings in chronic graft-versus-host disease. Hopefully you can see that the skin findings in chronic disease are more varied than in acute and may be challenging to differentiate from other dermatologic processes. We grade joint involvement of graft-versus-host disease by the limitation in range of motion of the shoulders, elbows, wrists and fingers, and ankles. And you can see in this figure the degree of limitation that can be observed in joint involvement, which corresponds to the lower numbers here. Although you might not have cared for a GBHD patient so far in your training, they represent a sizable portion of our transplant survivors. On average, half of allotransplant patients are affected by acute GBHD, depending on, upon their donor type, conditioning regimen, and other variables. Chronic GBHD affects anywhere from 20 to 50% of allotransplant survivors. GBHD is the leading cause of mortality outside of relapse for AML patients who undergo transplant, which is shown in this pie chart. It's hard to read here, but this is showing causes of mortality among um, HLA-matched and unrelated donor transplants for AML. The, causes, the top cause of death after a transplant is relapse of primary disease, which is shown in the blue. The second most common is GVHD, which is shown in the orange. And infection is third, shown in gray. 
um, based on, um, oh, um, sorry, those who do not die from GVHD do experience significant disease and treatment-related morbidity. So based on what I've shown you about disease manifestations, you'll probably not be surprised that GVHD is the leading cause of reduced quality of life after transplant. Therefore, effective and minimally toxic treatments of GVHD remains a central goal of transplant programs worldwide. Unfortunately, GVHD treatment to date is imperfect. Historically, we've relied on general immunosuppression to target global T cell activity. Strategies have included using calcineurin inhibitors and methotrexate for GVHD prevention, which I'll elaborate on later in the talk, and systemic corticosteroids for GVHD treatment. Such blanketed immunosuppression increases the risk of opportunistic infection, while the pharmacologic agents themselves put patients at risk for end organ toxicity, such as nephrotoxicity in the setting of calcineurin inhibitors. Finally, blocking alloreactivity creates a risk of blunting the graft versus tumor effect that contributes to transplant efficacy. So more recently, there's been a movement away from the blunt instrument of immunosuppression for the prevention and treatment of GVHD to the more refined approach of immunomodulation. In immunomodulation, specific aspects of the immune system are manipulated to target pathways that are involved in GVHD while minimizing immunosuppression and preserving graft versus tumor effects. Examples of this approach include decreasing effector T cells, increasing regulatory T cells, and down-regulating inflammatory pathways such as cytokines and second messengers. For the remainder of the talk, I'll describe selected strategies to refine our approach to the prevention and treatment of GVHD with a focus on efforts here at UH. So let's start with GVHD prophylaxis. Up into the 1980s, the standard of care for GVHD prophylaxis was methotrexate, administered in small doses on days 1, 3, 6, and 11 after transplant. Methotrexate's mechanism of action has traditionally been understood as folate antagonism, which decreases the availability of DNA building blocks for rapidly dividing cells, including activated T cells. More recently, our understanding of methotrexate's effects on the immune system has broadened, and it's now recognized that methotrexate also affects immune signaling by regulating second messengers like adenosine, cytokines, reactive oxygen species, and adhesion molecules. In the mid-1980s, addition of cyclosporin, a calcineurin inhibitor, was found to decrease rates of acute GVHD and improve overall survival compared to methotrexate alone. The mechanism of action of calcineurin inhibitors is shown on the right. When a T cell receptor recognizes an allogeneic peptide or MHC molecule in the antigen-presenting cell, calcium is released inside the T cells. Calcium binds calcineurin, which then dephosphorylates the transcription factor NFAT, which then translocates to the nucleus and promotes the expression of IL-2. Calcineurin inhibitors block calcineurin from dephosphorylating NFAT resulting in decreased production of IL-2. Eventually, a head-to-head -head comparison of calcineurin inhibitors demonstrated that tacrolimus was superior to cyclosporin with respect to prevention of acute GVHD, and the combination of tacrolimus and methotrexate became the standard of care for GVHD prophylaxis. Importantly, the efficacy of this standard prophylaxis regimen remains only about 50% and is higher in mismatch or, or alternative donor transplants, and toxicities are significant. So how might we modulate the immune response to better prevent acute graft versus host disease? So one strategy utilizes precisely timed cyclophosphamide to target destruction of alloreactive T cells following the donor cell infusion. Cytoxan cross or cyclophosphamide cross-links DNA in rapidly dividing cells and it's utilized in the treatment of cancer and autoimmune disease. The strategy behind post-transplant psi is the timing. After stem cell infusion, alloreactive T cells proliferate around T plus three to T plus four, shown here, while regulatory T cells, which offset graft-versus-host disease, do not proliferate until later. When cytoxin is administered during this specific time frame, the alloreactive T cells that mediate GVHD can be targeted and destroyed. Post-transplant psi was first tested in haploidentical or half-matched transplants, and rates of graft-versus-host disease were found to be well below historical controls. 
Later, it was tested in matched transplants in combination with tacrolimus and cell scepter mycophenolate mofetil. This combination resulted in less GVHD and improved GVHD and relapse-free survival compared to the standard regimen of tacromethotrexate. In order to test the benefit of post-transplant psi in a phase three setting, the Bone Marrow Transplant Clinical Trials Network, or BMTCTN, has designed a phase three randomized control trial comparing the standard of care, tacromethotrexate, to a combination of post-transplant psi, tacro, and methotrexate. The study design is shown here. Patients are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive tacromethotrexate, or tacro um, post-transplant psi and MMS. The primary endpoint is one year uh, GVHD and relapse-free survival. The secondary endpoints include standard measures of relapse and mortality, as well as rates of acute and chronic GVHD. Simon Cancer Center is the site of this trial, and we just enrolled our first patients last week. Another potential strategy to prevent graft-versus-host disease utilizes alpha-1 antitrypsin. Alpha-1 antitrypsin, as you may be familiar, is an inhibitor of neutrophil elastase in the lung, and its congenital absence leads to emphysema and is treated with enzyme replacement therapy. More recently, alpha-1 antitrypsin has been discovered to have tolerogenic immunomodulatory properties through both direct and indirect interaction with various cytokines and immune receptors. Moreover, it's been found to exert anti-inflammatory effects in animal models of disease, including GVHD. Shown on the right is data from a mouse study in which three types of mismatched allogeneic transplants were performed, labeled A, B, and C. The control animals, which are shown in the blue circles, received autologous stem cells and served as negative controls. The animals who did not receive alpha-1 antitrypsin as their GVHD prophylaxis are shown in red, and they had a median overall survival of 60 to 70 days after transplant. Mice who received the alpha-1 antitrypsin GVHD prophylaxis are shown in green and essentially overlap um, the negative control population, which suggests that alpha-1 antitrypsin is protective against the development of GVHD, at least in mice. In a, an early phase human trial, alpha-1 antitrypsin did lead to improvement in GVHD in the majority of patients with steroid refractory disease, which is a notoriously challenging population to treat. It also resulted in increased numbers of Tregs and was well tolerated. So Simon Cancer Center was selected as a site for a phase 2-3 study of alpha-1 antitrypsin for graft-versus-host disease prophylaxis in match unrelated donor transplants utilizing a myeloablative conditioning. In the first part of the study design, three different doses of alpha-1 antitrypsin, which are comparable to those used in uh, enzyme deficiency, are administered in addition to the standard tacrolimus methotrexate in an open-label fashion to determine an appropriate dose level for the placebo-controlled randomized portion of the study. The primary endpoint is acute GVHD-free survival through 180 days after transplant, and secondary endpoints address chronic GVHD incidence relapse, infection, and pharmacokinetics. We hope to have this trial open in the next few weeks to months. So now I'd like to transition our focus from prevention to treatment of graft-versus-host disease, starting with acute GVHD. Corticosteroids have been the standard of care for first-line treatment of acute GVHD since the dawn of stem cell transplantation, and to date, no other agent, either alone or in combination, has shown to be superior. In the setting of limited disease, which is defined by a skin rash that is covering less than 25% of body surface area, topical steroids can be used to treat GVHD. But for more extensive skin involvement or for GI or liver involvement, systemic corticosteroids are indicated. Steroids are typically dosed at one to two milligrams per kilogram per day, depending on the severity of disease, and tapered over several weeks. The efficacy is modest, about 50%, and toxicities result in significant morbidity and sometimes even mortality. A complete list of steroid-related toxicities is shown on the right. The ones that affect our patients the most include immunosuppression, the need to defer vaccinations, endocrinopathies, and loss of bone density. Shown here are corticosteroid toxicities in a meme format. <laughs> Due to these toxicities, identification of steroid-sparing treatments for GVHD is a high priority. 
Recently, inhibition of JAK-SAT signaling has emerged as a therapeutic strategy that allows faster steroid tapering and avoidance of some steroid-associated adverse events. So JAK proteins are non-receptor tyrosine kinases that signal within the JAK-SAT pathway shown here on the right, which regulates many cellular functions that are related to proliferation and inflammation. When a cytokine binds its receptor, JAK proteins associate with STAT proteins and phosphorylate them. The STAT proteins then translocate to the nucleus and activate the expression of genes that are involved in growth or inflammation. JAKs 1, 2, and 3 mediate T cell activation through cytokine signaling. In addition, JAK1 uniquely binds interferon gamma and IL-6 and plays roles in the activation of dendritic cells and neutrophils. Inhibition of JAK signaling in mice and humans has shown exciting results in the setting of GVHD. Oops, I'm not quite there yet. When mice uh, with GVHD were treated with a JAK1 inhibitor, there was a decrease in stat phosphorylation, decreased cytokines in the serum, and decreased T cell infiltrates in gut biopsies. These data have been reported in abstract form but have not been published with figures, which is why they're not pictured here. In humans, dual inhibition of JAK1 and JAK2 with a dual inhibitor ruxolitinib resulted in improved GVHD symptoms as shown on the right. The left-hand panel shows skin manifestations of GVHD which were refractory to steroids. Addition of ruxolitinib resulted in improved symptoms and the ability to taper steroids. In addition, serum cytokine concentrations decreased and the number of circulating activated T cells went down. So these observations led to the recent FDA approval of ruxolitinib for steroid refractory acute GVHD. But what if we could improve responses to steroids before reaching the refractory stage? Could adding a JAK inhibitor to frontline treatment improve response rate, shorten time to response, or minimize steroid dependence? Simon Cancer Center recently participated in an industry-sponsored trial in patients with newly diagnosed GVHD requiring systemic steroids. The patients were randomized to receive a JAK inhibitor called idacitinib or placebo in addition to standard corticosteroids. The primary endpoint was overall response rate at day 28. Secondary endpoints included immune response markers and pharmacokinetics of this novel agent. We enrolled five patients on the trial and are participating in ongoing data analysis. Those who have treated GVHD for some time know that it's a clinically variable disease with respect to organ involvement and to treatment response. Recently, high-risk cohorts of GVHD patients have been identified. They progress quickly and demonstrate poor responses to treatment. I will identify these high-risk cohorts and introduce some new strategies to improve their outcomes. So I've already mentioned that steroid refractory GVHD is difficult to treat. Steroid refractory disease is defined by disease progression after three days of treatment or failure to improve after 7 to 14 days, depending on the stage of disease. Steroid-resistant GVHD is associated with increased mortality and decreased response to, to second-line agents, which is shown here on the right. The top is a survival curve that shows um, that treatment-sensitive patients, which are shown in purple, live longer than treatment-resistant patients, which are shown in orange. Also, the steroid refractory patients are more likely to remain treatment resistant at week four, here, as shown on the bottom. The severity of GVHD and the extent of organ involvement also predict poor outcomes. The recently defined Minnesota criteria define high-risk GVHD according to nine specific combinations of organ system involvement and severity. High-risk patients have increased treatment-related mortality so these are high-risk patients shown at the top, standard-risk patients shown at the bottom, and transplant-related mortality on the y-axis. They also have decreased response to treatment shown on the bottom right. So this is response to treatment, standard-risk patients, and high-risk patients. A third high-risk cohort is identified based on serum biomarkers measured at the time of diagnosis. The biomarkers are ST2, which is a soluble receptor of interleukin-1, and REG3-alpha, a marker of intestinal injury. When placed in an algorithm, these two biomarkers produce a score that then predicts treatment response and mortality. In the Ann Arbor scoring system, low numbers predict good response and low mortality, whereas a high score predicts poor response to treatment and high mortality. So low scores here 
shown as one, have the best response, higher scores have the lowest response to treatment. Low scores have the lowest number or lowest percentage of non-relapse mortality. High scores have a higher number of non-relapse mortality. The slides are a little bit hard to read and I apologize. Um, <clears throat> so how can we better help these patients? As far as steroid refractory disease goes, we discussed the recent approval of ruxolitinib, which was a JAK-1-2 inhibitor by the FDA. But not all patients will respond, and some cannot tolerate ruxolitinib due to cytopenia. There is no standard of care for the newly recognized high-risk acute GVHD categories defined by the Minnesota and the Ann Arbor criteria. Second-line treatments of acute GVHD generally consist of pan T-cell suppressors, anti-TNF antibodies, ATG, which is anti-thymocyte globulin, um, serolimus, and mycophenolate mofetil. The problem with these treatments is that they are all hammers, wiping out um, T cells non-selectively and paving the way for opportunistic infection and other side effects. So we hypothesize that combining well-tolerated immunomodulatory therapies for high-risk GVHD may maximize therapeutic benefit while minimizing toxicity. The first intervention is extracorporeal photophoresis, or ECP. ECP is an apheresis procedure in which whole blood is removed from the patient and peripheral blood mononuclear cell fractions isolated, which is shown here in yellow. The red cells and plasma are returned to the patient, shown in red. The peripheral blood mononuclear site fraction, which contains immune cells, is treated with a photosensitizing agent and then exposed to UVA light. The treated cells are then returned to the circulation. This procedure is FDA approved for the treatment of cutaneous T cell lymphoma and is thought to work by inducing apoptosis in circulating malignant T cells. In GVHD, the mechanism is thought to be more nuanced and involves differentiation of monocytes, increases in Tregs, and decreases in circulating cytokines. As a single agent, it's widely used as a salvage therapy for steroid refractory acute GVHD and it's extremely well tolerated. The second immunomodulatory intervention is infusion of mesenchymal stem cells, or MSCs. MSCs have the potential to differentiate into various non-hematopoietic cell types, including adipocytes, chondrocytes, and osteoblasts. They're typically present in the bone marrow stroma, where they play a supportive role, and they are also present wrapped around blood vessels where they are poised to aid in wound healing. MSC's immunomodulatory roles are an area of active investigation and include anti-inflammatory effects within the innate immune system and tolerogenic effects within the adaptive immune system. MSC infusion was recently shown to exhibit single agent activity in high-risk GVHD and is also very well tolerated. So we have developed an investigator-initiated trial of ECP and MSCs for high-risk GVHD patients. It involves twice-weekly twice ECP treatment, shown in the blue circles, um, which is our current institutional standard of care, plus two infusions of MSCs, shown in the red arrows, at doses that are demonstrated to improve GVHD symptoms in other trials. These interventions will overlap with standard dose corticosteroids and supportive care agents, shown here, with the goal of tapering the steroids if symptoms improve. The primary endpoint of the trial will be disease response at 28 days, and secondary endpoints will explore safety, relapse, effect on T cell subsets like Tregs, and quality of life. We plan to collaborate with Dr. Dallas in pediatric hematology oncology and Dr. Seckley in the Department of Immunology to determine the effect of combined treatment on immune cell and cytokine profiles shown here. And this study is currently in the process of institutional review. Another investigator-initiated trial that we're working on is fecal transplant for refractory GIGVHD. GIGVHD is associated with significant morbidity and mortality related to dehydration, malnutrition, TPN dependence, and infection. Most of you are probably aware of the growing evidence supporting the role of the gut microbiome in local inflammatory responses and infectious risks. Recently, investigators at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center reported that lower gut microbial diversity correlated with increased GVHD-related mortality. This is shown here where lower diversity patients are plotted in the red and higher microbial diversity patients are plotted in blue. And on the y-axis is the incidence of GVHD-related mortality. 
In an effort to restore microbiome diversity, fecal transplant has been used as a salvage treatment for steroid refractory acute GVHD, and in a few case reports and case series, fecal transplant has improved the gut microbiome diversity and led to short-term improvements in steroid refractory GI GVHD. So based on these observations, we've developed an investigator-initiated trial in which patients with grade 2 to 4 acute GVHD of the GI tract are treated with fecal transplant which is administered as a single dose of capsules containing stool from a healthy donor, obtained from a company called Open Biome. Primary endpoints are safety and efficacy, and exploratory endpoints include measures of micro and mycobiome diversity, which will be performed in collaboration with Dr. Mahmoud Ghanoum in the Department of Dermatology. And this study is also undergoing institutional review. So how about chronic GVHD? First and second line treatments are actually very similar to those for acute GVHD. First line therapy is with systemic corticosteroids with an average response rate around 50%. Second line treatments include familiar pan T cell inhibitors used in acute GVHD, as well as ECP and the anti CD20 antibody rituximab, which targets B cells. The role of B cells in GVHD is beyond the scope of this talk, but just know that they have been implicated in some of the fibrotic pathways in chronic graft-versus-host disease. The latest excitement in chronic GVHD management has focused on ibrutinib, which you may be familiar with in the context of B cell malignancy treatment. Ibrutinib's efficacy in CLL and B cell lymphoma is attributed to its inhibition of Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which is an important factor in B cell proliferative signaling. It also happens to inhibit a protein of similar structure that plays an important role in Th2 helper cells called IL2 inducible kinase, or ITK. ITK inhibition ameliorated GVHD symptoms in animal models, which prompted a human trial of abrutinib for steroid refractory chronic GVHD. In this non-randomized trial of 42 patients, of which 37 were evaluable for response, the majority had some clinical response to abrutinib, shown here with complete response of 24% and partial response of 51%. Consistent with the overall favorable response, average levels of pro-inflammatory biomarkers decreased over time, as you can see on this heat map. Average biomarker levels are shown in each square and they're plotted over time horizontally, with colors changing from red to purple to white as the values drop. Most exciting clinically was that responders to abrutinib were able to drop their daily dose of steroids, shown in the green bars, by about 50% by the end of the study. The steroid sparing effect was considered important enough to gain its approval by the FDA in August of 2017 for the treatment of steroid refractory chronic GVHD. Despite the excitement over the steroid sparing potential of ibrutinib, we have discovered that very few of our patients are able to either tolerate or benefit from this agent in the steroid refractory chronic GVHD setting. Thus, we continue to look for better agents. One emerging therapeutic target in chronic GVHD is called ROC2. ROC2 regulates cytokine release and T cell distribution such that its inhibition decreases the cytokines that are required for chronic GVHD pathogenesis. Its inhibition also increases Tregs, which offset the inflammatory pathways that are implicated in tissue damage and fibrosis. In a mouse study, which is shown here, the ROC2 inhibitor KD025 cured chronic GVHD-related bronchiolitis and improved skin symptoms in a mismatched transplant model. These are mice receiving either vehicle or KD025, which is the ROC2 inhibitor, and their GVHD skin score is plotted over time. You can see that those that are treated with a ROC2 inhibitor overall develop less severe skin GVHD than the ones treated with a vehicle. A phase one human study showed good tolerance and promising response rates, prompting the opening of a phase two trial. So we will be participating in the phase two trial of ROC2 inhibitor KD025 in patients with steroid refractory chronic GVHD. Patients will be randomized to one of two doses of the ROC2 inhibitor, which will be added to their current therapy. The primary endpoint is overall response rate, response rate, and the secondary endpoints are shown. It also probably has the best trial name I've ever seen. So I'd now like to transition the focus of the talk to our GVHD team here at UH. I'm currently staffing a dedicated GVHD clinic, which is designed to provide comprehensive and quality care to patients affected by GVHD. Patients are referred to the clinic upon their initial diagnosis or if their primary oncologist is seeking additional insights on treatment. 
At each visit, the patient completes a symptom and quality of life survey. They undergo a complete GVHD exam and assessment. This includes photo documentation of any skin findings and portable spirometry to detect changes in their lung function. Um, if indicated, they'll be referred to a subspecialist or screened for a clinical trial. It takes a village to treat GVHD, and we have a dedicated multidisciplinary uh, committee to keep us on track. The purpose of the GVHD committee is to improve the quality of care for our patients, and we do this by identifying yearly initiatives and pursuing them. So far, we've instituted an annual review of our GVHD standard operating procedures. We have standardized GVHD documentation in the EMR. We perform chart audits and quality improvement initiatives. We've established partnerships with subspecialists who are important to our patients' care, such as dermatology, oral medicine, et cetera. And we have um, sponsored educational programs. Um, and importantly, uh, we have found that since the institution of this committee, we have actually improved the accuracy and consistency of our clinical documentation. And these, um, this outcome was presented by Linda Baer, our committee chair, in an international meeting earlier this year. If you're interested in exploring graft-versus-host disease, I encourage you to rotate on the bone marrow transplant service, which is a fascinating um, experience. Uh, if you're interested in bench research, I can connect you with people doing basic science research in GVHD. If you're interested in clinical research, I have some ideas I'd like to get off the ground if you want to help me out. Um, I invite you to rotate in the GVHD clinic, which is every Friday with me. You can rotate in a related specialty, such as dermatology, to learn more about GVHD uh, symptoms. And you may consider attending a GVHD conference. So the GVHD National Symposium is an excellent conference that is held each year. It's actually, though it's national, um, it takes place very close to where we are. It's either in Cleveland, Pittsburgh, or Michigan um, every year and is very accessible. They have, a, they have parallel tracks for uh, healthcare providers and for patients. It's really very, very interesting and affordable um, conference to attend. And BMT InfoNet sponsors um, patient-centered conferences um, that focus on GVHD-related symptoms for patients, and their annual conference is taking place this week in Chicago. Um, in closing, I would like to acknowledge the bone marrow transplant program here for the outstanding training and mentorship that they provide to, provided to me. Um, this team includes physicians, um, advanced practice providers, um, the nurses on Sidemen 3, and our outpatient nurse partners, and the clinical trials team who help enroll and keep our patients on trial. I'd like to acknowledge our scientific collaborators for the exploratory aims that they will help us um, complete in our investigator-initiated trials. The GVHD committee, specifically and particularly Linda Baer, um, who does most of the work for all of us, which we really appreciate. Um, the Paul Calabrese Career Development Award, which is um, sponsoring uh, my investigator-initiated trial on ECP and MSCs. And most importantly, the GVHD patients and their families. And in closing, I invite you to remember the holy grail of GVHD treatment, which is maximizing graft versus tumor effect and minimizing GVHD. Thank you. That was fantastic. I, I, knew you, I knew when you were an MSCP student, you were a rock star. Now it's all come full circle. So, um, Dr. Slaughter, you're outstanding. Thank you. Uh, can you uh, comment on whether or not Yeah, that's a really good question. So asking whether um, restoring gut microbial diversity may help in other um, organs that are affected by GVHD. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great thought. I don't know the answer. Um, I think as we learn more about how localized immunity affects, you know, widespread immunity, I certainly think so. Also, um, local effects can, um, if there's uh, local immunoregulation, there may be release of systemic factors that can then um, affect other organ systems. So that's, that's a great point. We might consider expanding our, our patient eligibility. That's a good question. I know as an ID practitioner, when we get consulted on these patients, they're really scary. So they're, they're already sick from the underlying disease, and they're highly immunosuppressed, and they have an inflammatory process, and, and, and it makes me anxious, just so you know. Um, <laughs> You're not um, alone. Um, so patients that develop acute uh, GVD, some of them are cured mm -hmm. and go on for a prolonged remission, 
what's the thought process? Does it get tolerance, or and why, why do some patients not get more chronic GVD? Like, why do some get acute and not progress? Acute and, and then not right. chronic, and they're acute. Versus Response to therapy. Yeah. yeah. I think we're trying to figure that out. I mean, you, you're asking all the right questions that, that we struggle with on a daily basis. Um, I think that we're starting to get a clue about what might be important by at least looking at pre and identifying predictors of high risk disease. So, all the high risk cohorts are those who end up being treatment resistant. Mm -hmm. So, um, as we're identifying these biomarkers, are the biomarkers um, important in act the mechanisms of resistance, or are they mm -hmm. just kind of bystanders, and I think um, we're, we're, we come against very often the limitations in our, our knowledge of disease mechanism, um, and so I think the, the role of understanding immunology is becoming more and more important, and we're just trying to catch up with what we're seeing clinically, um, but it's a great question right now. I, I don't think we really know yet. And just to reiterate something you said, the um, you know, hematology and, and uh, is not a core part of the internal medicine and rotation curriculum, but the group has always been really welcome to having students and trainees um, rotate with them. It sounds like you... I would definitely yeah. underscore that. I think there's there's a lot to learn. It's a um, kind of a well-oiled machine where we um, see a lot of different and exciting patients, and it's full of um, people who have been treating um, malignant hematology patients for years and have so much experience that they're willing to, to share with you. So I highly recommend it. So for um, for acute, it's about 50% total, so all comers, so mild or a severe form. Um, and then for chronic, it's anywhere between 20 to 50%, so also a little bit variable, but that means really half of our population will be dealing with this in some way. One last question? So, um, well, so just first to address the first question, um, timing matters, but also talking to someone who is experienced in um, deciding whether that's appropriate for that patient is also important. So I would say timely consultation is 
the most important thing. Um, will it affect, it, can it affect enrollment in clinical trials? It, it can. Some of our, um, like our first line um, trial with the idacitinib plus corticosteroids, if a patient had been treated for more than 48 hours with steroids, we're ineligible to go on study. So it just requires a lot of um, thinking ahead. As soon as we see a new GVHD patient, we all had to kind of talk to each other really quickly, make sure we didn't lose our opportunity to enroll in a study. Some of these studies have extended the window to about you know, three days, but it's still tough. Um, so just awareness and conversation, you know, the more you can talk to us about it, then we'll help the patient in that way. If you can always, you can always call us. We'd rather be called than not. We'll be nice. And I want to thank you again for a fantastic presentation. Congratulations on sort of taking on this really interesting area. Thank you. Thank you very much.